Dr. Trajera for organizing this colloquium for us. And I would like to sincerely welcome everyone uh, for your participation. And thank you so much for being a part of this research colloquium. May I start sharing my screen now? So good afternoon once again, and um, uh, my warmest welcome to everyone. I am privileged to share with you the result of my study. And uh, my study is on the level of resiliency among Lasallian academic officers. Background of the study, school leadership demands physical, emotional and intellectual energies. Thus, academic officers need to be resilient in coping with the demands of school leaders' work. This study aimed to determine the level of resiliency among Lasallian academic officers, especially in the years of transition. Results of the study may be used as a basis for the institution's administrators formation program. Specifically, this study sought to answer the following questions. First, what is the profile of the Lasallian academic officers in the following categories? Age, sex, civil status, highest educational attainment, gross monthly income, length of service, and number of subordinates. Second, what is the level of resiliency among Lasallian academic officers in terms of the following? Resilience factors on perception of self, perception of future, structured style, social competence, family cohesion, and social resources. And third and the last, is there a significant relationship between the Lasallian academic officer's level of resiliency in terms of the following, gross monthly income, length of service, and number of subordinates. May I share with you the significant findings of the study? As to the participants' demographic profile, majority of the Lasallian academic officers are female, a number of participants are middle-aged. They are mostly married, and more than half of them have doctorate degrees. Though half of the participants, which is 50%, have a monthly income within the 40,000 to 59,999 range around 28.6% earn below 40,000. Almost half of the participants, which accounts to 42.9%, have been employed within 11 to 20 years. In particular, a majority, which is 57.1% of the participants, have only been in their administrative position within five years. Being administrators, most of the participants supervise less than 10 persons. To continue as to the resilience factors on perception of self, results revealed that the academic officer's level of resiliency on personal strength, again, on pers uh, perception of self is high with a total mean of 4.27. For the academic officer's level of resiliency on personal strength, specifically on perception of future, results revealed that uh, the result is also high. Academic officer's level of resiliency on structured style has a total of 4.37 mean, which is equivalent 
to a verbal interpretation of also high. The academic officer's level of resiliency on social competence, which speaks of the ability of a person to be people-oriented as well as uh, a team player, it, uh, has a total mean of 4.14, which is also high. On uh, family cohesion, the academic officer's level of resiliency is also high. And uh, the academic officer's level of resilience on social resources, which includes uh, social support or the support system of the participants, we have a very high uh, resiliency result with an average mean of four, uh, 4.55. With this, the overall mean for academic officers level of resiliency, considering the resilience factors on perception of self, perception of future, structured style, social competence, family cohesion and social resources has a uh, average mean of 4.36, uh, which is high. On relationship between academic officers' level of resiliency and gross monthly income, results revealed that it is not significant. This is the same with academic officers' level of resiliency and length of service as well as number of subordinates. In the light of the findings, the following conclusions are formulated. A majority of the Lasallian academic officers are middle-aged adults, females, married, and doctorate degree holders. Most of them have served within their <clears throat> term limits, which is for three to five years, as administrators handling an ideal number of subordinates under their care and receiving a sufficient monthly salary. The Lasallian academic officers' level of resiliency is high. They are able to cope with and adjust to the demands of the institution. Hence, they are resilient. Although there is an inverse relationship between the academic officer's level of resiliency and the number of years as administrator, as well as number of subordinates, yet there is no significant relationship between the administrator's level of resiliency and gross monthly income and the aforementioned variables. Thus, regardless of the gross monthly income, length of service as administrators, and number of subordinates handled, the level of resiliency among Lasallian academic officers remains high. Thus, this study recommends that the results of the study serve as an affirmation to the Lasallian academic officers' level of resiliency or their resiliency profile and as a basis for the institution to develop a resiliency program for administrators to sustain their work productivity with the demands of administrative work. With this, thank you so much for your kind attention and good afternoon once again. I am now open for your questions or clarifications. And again, Dr. Uh, Shaila Dokshe, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Jo. Um, I am very much uh, grateful to Dr. Tony, who moderated a while ago, a nation um, uh, following uh, the COVID-19 uh, compliance in CLMMRH. But I am out now, so uh, we are continuing our uh, webinar. Uh, we will be asking um, at this time, our reactor for the presentation of Dr. Cadena in the person of uh, Mr. Circes Malaga. Uh, Mr. Malaga is formerly our faculty in the College of Nursing and became Dean uh, of the St. John Rojas uh, College of Nursing. 
And as of the moment, Mr. Malaga is actually the head of the provincial government um, of Negros Occidental Research and Innovation Unit. So without further ado, I would like everyone to welcome uh, Mr. Sir Cesc Malaga, a very actor with a round of applause, virtual applause. Hello, good afternoon. Good Can you afternoon, hear me, guys? Sir X. <clears throat> it's yes, nice sir. to be back. No, Mr. X. <laughs> it's nice to be back again. Huh? Once Alasarian, always Alasarian. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dinja, huh, for that wonderful presentation. It is indeed an affirmation of our Lasallian traits and core values. The results speak for itself. Now you were able to mention the let me the the perception of self, future, structured style, social competence, family cohesion, and social resources. So all of this is high in terms of the results. And one thing in particular that I would like to note is the social resources. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it, it is very high. Mm -hmm. no? um, probably as part of our Lasallian core values, I, I would say I would still a Lasallian. <laughs> I am a Lasallian because I've been there for eight years and now I'm currently finishing my dissertation. So probably an additional of three years. So it is embedded imbibe in me the Lasallian core values of faith, service, and communion. And you talk about the, and I mean, it was presented that the social resource is very high. Mm. So probably uh, one core value that is um, very important that, that I have learned and uh, love would be our communion in mission, our oneness in community. So probably, uh, that really speaks volume of our being Lasallian, now our, our our social resource. Because I'm wondering, all of, all of the results um, are high, except for one. Not except for one, the social resources. Which is so very it's, high. It, yes, which is very high. So probably I'm thinking when I was in Lasall and I'm, I'm up to now. <laughs> uh, uh, being there uh, or going there or being um, there, it feels like in a community that you are one in a community, you are one in mission, no, in in faith, in in service. No, once um, I am I am a student moderator, so feel the feel I, I do belong, no, in uh, in Lasal. So so that uh, really uh, speaks volume of. Uh, being our oneness with the community. And um, another thing is, um, it is not surprising that it is very, it's high in terms of the overall results, uh, probably because of the Lasallian, uh, again, our standards, mm -hmm. uh, our standards. So this again boils down to our values, our traits, our standards of excellence. So probably, and this is a study for academic officers. Yeah. No? So it's really expected. No? So I was once also a dean. So it's really expected of us to have that, um, to, uh, to, what do you call that? Uh, to fulfill no? that expectations coming from our, from within our community. So I would say really that this is an affirmation and for your recommendation, you were able to, uh, to mention that to sustain. Mm. So yes, really, because that uh, these are uh, our traits again and our core, va uh, core values that, that should be uh, strengthened, that should be sustained you know, and uh, uh, maintain our Lasallian excellence. So probably uh, that's it. Dinjo, no? congratulations and thank you for giving us that affirmation no? uh, from your thank study. You. Thank you, Sir <laughs> X. Um, part of the limitation, is it okay, Doc Shea, that I 
<laughs> I also share something about the study. Uh, yeah, uh, as an academic officer on that year that I conducted this, I excluded myself, of course, as part of the mm. uh, limitation, no? uh, of, or of course, no, the scope and limitation of the study. And uh, I was also affirmed uh, by the result of how resilient academic officers amid challenges uh, uh, in the administration, especially on the years of transition. This happened actually during the year when there was a transition from the implementation of uh, the K-12 and that mm -hmm. we were challenged even on how to ensure that we can meet the expectations of our stakeholders, uh, primarily on meeting standards without compromising the quality of education that we deserve as La Salians. So uh, I was uh, actually motivated to study this uh, and uh, I was fortunate as well uh, because of the overwhelming support of the office of the CROMI, uh, the Center for Research and Engagement, of course, with our ABLE um, and uh, uh, dynamic leadership of our research coordinator, Doc Shai. No? So, um, on years that I was not with the College of Nursing, I was also fulfilled uh, working as an administrator and now sharing the result of my study, which is an affirmation that we were not influenced after all with our income, neither that of our stay uh, as officers, uh, even the number of years we serve and uh, the number of people who we supervise. We remained resilient and uh, uh, yes, I would like to claim that uh, it was proven through this research and validated also to the research literatures that I have included in the complete no, uh, full paper, I mean in the entire uh, paper uh, of my study. Thank you, Sir X, for your uh, reaction as well. And Dr. thank, thank you, you so Jill. much again for the privilege. I think Dr. Shaila is uh, was cut uh, a minute ago, Dr. Jo. Again, okay. once again, we would like to thank and congratulate Dr. Jocelyn May Flor Cadena for uh, presenting successfully her research output. Thank you, Dr. And, uh, we like thank you also. also. We would like also to uh, say thank you to Sir, Sir Cesc Malaga. Uh, co uh, commonly called as Sir X here in uh, our community. Thank you for generously sharing your observations and also your experiences as one of uh, our Lasallian members for more than 10 years. We will now proceed to our second presenter this afternoon. Our second presenter is Mr. Glenn Dolendo, also our faculty in the College of Nursing and uh, currently connected in the province. Okay, presenting her research output entitled Compassion Fatigue Among Nurses on Selected Province Owned Hospitals. Virtual applause piece to Sir Glenn Delendo. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khan, and uh, good, afternoon. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, the, the students, the faculty and staff, uh, and uh, the entire community of, uh, of La Salle for inviting me to present my result uh, entitled The Compassion Fatigue and Coping Strategies Among Nurses on Selected uh, uh, Province-Owned Hospitals. And I would like also to thank our uh, beloved Governor, uh, Eugenio Jose Bong Lakson, and to our Provincial Administrator, uh, Attorney um, Rifrando Diaz, for their untiring support to finish our, our study about uh, the compassion fatigue in, in our selected hospital. And also, we would like to thank our, my mentor, Sir X, uh, for, for his untiring support also and uh, to help 
uh, me to to finish my my study. Okay, so to start, uh, I would like to to share to you the recent um, study about compassion fatigue by Ruiz Fernandez, twenty twenty, during the COVID nineteen. Uh, the the researcher or the the author mentioned that despite of of uh, the health crisis, uh, crisis situation today during the COVID-19 and its implication for healthcare professionals, the level of compassion fatigue and burnout remained moderate and high level because they mentioned uh, because of the coping strategies of our healthcare provider such as motivation and um, um, and coping strategies. Uh, this, uh, this, this actually uh, time me to present my, my result about compassion fatigue because this will relate on the, the present uh, healthcare crisis situation in implication for healthcare professionals. Compassion fatigue has been defined uh, as loss of satisfaction that comes from doing uh, one's job well or uh, job-related distress that outweighs the job sat uh, satisfaction. Nurses opt to lead the path where caring is vital. Nurses choose a lifetime commitment with compassion uh, altruism and kindness that only to those in need of physical cure, but to all facets of human being, the holistic approach of caring. Does it enable to change uh, our perspective in life and consume the optimism of uh, as our characteristic as nurse? Ideally, as nurses, we should feel satisfied with our work and derive satisfaction from providing an excellent care. The capacity uh, for compassion and empathy is at the core of a nurse's ability to do work. However, they may also become wounded from, by work of care. Coping with stress, on the other hand, is important for human survival and can be defined as the process of um, managing external and internal demands that are perceived as taxing on a personal capacities and resources. Since then, compassion fatigue was addressed to be a significant pro problem in the field of nursing, especially here in Negros Occidental, and has taken um, uh, on more meaning for much a broader group of people. Furthermore, it, is, it has fought our best interest to pursue the study regarding compassion fatigue among nurses on selected uh, province-owned hospitals. The, the study aimed to determine the, the profile of nurses on selected province-owned hospitals according to their age, gender and civil status. The level of compassion fatigue among nurses in the hospital with their group according to their profiles. The level of compassion fatigue and, 
uh, among nurses on selected province owned hospital. The significant difference of compassion fatigue and coping strategies on selected province owned hospital. The extent use of the identified coping strategies among nurses in the hospital in terms of uh, problem focus, uh, coping, and emotion focus. And last, the uh, significant difference in the extent of use of the identified coping strategies among nurses in the hospital when they are grouped according to their various departments. Okay, so the, uh, it's a uh, typographical error. So the significance of the study, uh, the result of the study are useful to us nurses, a healthcare institution, community, and researcher. Okay, for my theoretical framework, uh, the, the two uh, theories are utilized by Jean uh, Watson, the theory of human caring, or the philosophy and theory of, of transpersonal caring, and also by Popman and Lazarus, cognitive uh, motivational relationship uh, theory of coping. Okay, so out of the presented ob objectives, uh, the hypothesis below was set forth. There is no significant difference on compassion fatigue and coping strategies among nurses in the hospital when they are grouped according to their profile. And there is no significant difference on compassion fatigue and coping strategies among nurses in the selected province-owned hospital when they are grouped according to various departments. For my method, first, the instrument was uh, utilized or used in the study is the standardized questionnaire by Hadnal Stam, 2012. And the Ways of Coping Questionnaire by Pokemon Lazarus was also utilized in the study to measure the coping strategies of respondents. The sample size is technique, a total population sample technique. According to American Journal Theoretical and Applied Statistics, that a total population sampling is the most practical when the total population is manageable size, such as a well-defined subgroup of a larger population. And the statistical tool was also utilized are the following, the Pascal Wallace rank sum test and the Wilson rank sum test. For my validity, since uh, uh, we are using the standardized questionnaire, it has been validated in, uh, so this is often Sir, Sir Glenn, excuse me, you are muted, Sir Glenn. Please turn on your audio. Thank you. Since uh, for our validity and reliability, since we are using the standardized questionnaire, it has been validated in several populations and shown to have a high reliability and validity index for assessing a compassion fatigue. Scoring of each uh, subcategory range from 5 to 50. A score of 22 or less is scored a low, uh, low and a score of 21 to 20. To 41 scores an average, and 42 or higher is considered a high score uh, com compassion fatigue. For our data gathering procedure, to gather the NISAR data for this study, we sent a letter to the, to the uh, provincial governor and to our provincial administrator and to, to the significant respondents of the study. And for our ethical considerations, we talked and discussed uh, the considerations of our study to the provincial governor and to our provincial gov uh, administrator for that reason. Okay, so, 
So most of the respondents are within 25 to 35 age group. Majority are females. Half of the population are single nurses. Also, all, all of the respondents have rotated upon uh, scheduled assignments in various departments. Thus, exposure in various departments is a considerable factor in the level and incidence rate of compassion fatigue. The level of incidence rate of compassion fatigue as a whole was average. Overall, the incidence rate and level of compassion fatigue are interpreted as average compassion, satisfaction, burnout, secondary traumatic stress are indicative to have an average compassion fatigue. So these are the results and discussion of my study. For, for my profile of the respondents, if we are, as you can see, the, the most numbered uh, population for, for our respondents are the age group of 25 to 35 years old, comprising a 75.9% uh, or a 29 out of 170 population. And the lowest uh, population or respondents age group of 56 to 65 years old. For our gender, male and female, uh, shown in the table uh, uh, that 72.4 uh, are females and male, uh, 47 out of 100, 170 are males. For our civil status profile, the larger population are composed of single, and the second was married, and one out of 170 is widow. Okay, first, the level of compassion fatigue among nurses. Okay, so this is the, the, the specific uh, level of compassion satisfaction by age gender and civil status. I will show you the, the, summer, uh, the summary of uh, the level of compassion fatigue by age, gender, and civil status. As you can see, no, the age group of 25 to 35 years old, the result is 43.3421 is high on the rating. Uh, uh, the rating for for coping uh, for our compassion fatigue is 43 above, so that is high result. The rest are average, from 36 to 65 uh, to 65 years old. For our gender, for compassion satisfaction, meaning uh, the 25 to 35 years old are high satisfaction on their job. And the rest are on average satisfaction. For gender, male is also average, scores 38.94. Uh, 94. For female, 137.19. So that's also an average score for, satisfaction, uh, for compassion satisfaction. For civil status, uh, all of the, the civil stat, uh, status are scored average. For burn, burnout per profile, all of the profiles are scored average. Okay, for also for our uh, secondary traumatic stress, so all profiles are scored average. Okay, so this is the, the summary of uh, the components of compassion fatigue by age. As you can see, the, the greater value are on the 25 to 35 years old according to their satisfaction rate. Okay? And the lowest are uh, from 36 to 45 years old. And it is considered as the moderate or average um, compassion fatigue. And also for burnout, the age group uh, are equal from 25 to 65 years old, and it's scored as average burnout, and it is considered as 
average compassion fatigue by age in burnout. For secondary traumatic uh, stress, all of the ages are scored uh, average and also considered uh, moderate in level of compassion fatigue by age. According to Adam, age is increased risk for uh, secondary stress and uh, burnout decrease. Nurses under 30 years old of age also reported significantly higher rates of burnout. However, nurses overall experience average or low level of burnout depending on their ways of coping with stress. And also uh, cited by, by Kelly, nurses under 40 years old had significant lower compassion satisfaction. Yes, as you can see the, the result. And may have average to high levels of burnout, burnout and secondary uh, traumatic stress. And also nurses who had more clinical experience parallel to those individuals who have been directly and repeatedly exposed to the traumatic event. For the level of compassion fatigue by gender, as you can see, the, the level of compassion satisfaction are higher, a male is higher than female. Okay, so meaning the, the, the compassion or the satisfaction rating of male are higher than your female and considered that, um, that uh, there is a high or an, uh, an average or moderate uh, compassion fatigue in female. For burnout by gender, the level of compassion fatigue are, are moderate in all sexes or in all gender. For stress or secondary uh, traumatic stress, all sexes are equal in uh, average score and um, considered an average or a moderate compassion fatigue by secondary traumatic stress. And according to Kalimo, uh, reported that burnout in female may be attributed to dual role of homemaker and male nurses as the counterpart, especially on married ones, which may likely predispose them to experience many job-related stress and average level of burnout. For level of compassion to their uh, civil status, before yellow color, that is for compassion satisfaction. For single, mostly they are on average or moderate uh, compassion satisfaction and considered in average or moderate compassion fatigue by, by single. And also uh, for burnout and uh, Secondary traumatic stress have also a, an average um, burnout and uh, secondary traumatic stress for single and considered also a, an average or moderate, moderate uh, compassion fatigue for uh, civil status. For married, uh, same with the uh, single, there is an average score or average rating for compassion satisfaction and considered also an average compassion fatigue for merit. And also for their burnout and secondary uh, traumatic stress, they scored also um, moderate or average. Uh, for civil staff or married the person. For widowed, uh, it scores moderate. So meaning all of the civil status are all a scores an average compassion party by civil status. And according to Adicola, shows that both married and single nurses appeared more vulnerable due to some factors. 
high higher autonomy, professional development, empowerment, work environment, and fundamentals of quality nursing care care all relate to burnout. Thus, the result indicates that both that both married married and single nurses are experiencing experiencing an average level of burnout. Okay, for the level of compassion fatigue among nurses. Okay, so these are the, um, the specific uh, results for compassion satisfaction. So I'll show you uh, the, the, the summary of the level of compassion fatigue uh, in various departments. So as you can see, that so far, has high compassion satisfaction. And it is considered a low compassion fatigue. But they have a or an average uh, burnout and uh, secondary uh, traumatic stress and considered an average burnout and uh, secondary traumatic stress. And considered an average compassion fatigue by burnout and STS or secondary traumatic stress, and all of the and also the the outpatient department, they have a higher uh, compassion satisfaction, meaning uh, OPD has are considered a low compassion fatigue. But they have also a, an average score of burnout and uh, secondary traumatic stress. And considered an average compassion fatigue by burnout and secondary traumatic uh, stress. And all of the departments, except the OR and OPD, have an average um, compassion satisfaction, burnout, and secondary traumatic stress. And considered an, an average compassion fatigue in various departments or in departments. Okay, so according to uh, Cash Cashively, revealed that nurses experience higher satisfaction with good patient relationship. However, Hansacker et al. identified through their research that improving coping skills, stress management, motivation, and its Inspiration of nurses assigned in various departments promotes an average to high level of compassion satisfaction. And so also, the rate and burnout uh, among nurses have been found to be at a higher rate, with approximately 70% of hospital nurses having burnout levels. Many studies have indicated that the prevalence of burnout is higher among nurses who work stress in stressful departments with increased workload, extra hours and increased nurse patient, uh, patient ratio, such as the emergency department, ICU, pedia, medical, and OB-GYN. So level of compassion fatigue among nurses on selected hospitals. Okay, so this is the, the summary of level of compassion fatigue per hospital. So hospital one, has a higher uh, result on the compassion satisfaction, burnout, and uh, secondary traumatic stress. But they have scored an average, all of the hospitals scored an average rating of all components of compassion fatigue. Therefore, or, therefore it is considered all of the hospital has an average uh, compassion fatigue. Right. The significant difference of compassion fatigue. Okay. So the significant difference of compassion fatigue according to hospitals. The result shows that there is no significant difference in the level of compassion fatigue according to hospitals. according to their problem focus and uh, emotional focus. 
Okay, extent use of coping strategies. The table shows the extent of use of coping strategies. Results shows that both emotion focused, problem focused coping strategies have moderate extent use of coping strategies. A significant difference of coping according to identified variables. Okay, the table shows that the significant difference of coping according to identified variables. The result shows that the following variables, gender, hospital, uh, department, age, civil status, and employment status have no significant difference in, cope and, uh, in, in coping uh, strategies. A recommendation, strategies in facilitating techniques for hospital uh, administration to observe a holistic a state of nurse which are vulnerable to compassion fatigue, a strong communication relationship between staff nurses and other health uh, professionals for the facilitation of good work environment should be reinforced. Further studies of specifics and relevant factors, nursing service should uh, organize peer preceptorship of senior nurses. Since uh, our our uh, uh, affected by, uh, uh, personnel are on the early adult food, 25 to 35 years old, <clears throat> and also. Uh, The nursing service department in consonance with the hospital personnel department should develop a program of, or, and policies that will help enhance the clinical experience and promote uh, psychological or psychosocial needs of nurses. For utilization, uh, conduction of self-awareness program every six months, support group and open discussion about compassion fatigue, and on-site counseling, mental health days, and also a re, uh, providing a re, relaxation room and meditation classes, etc. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Glenn, for your presentation. Um, for sure, it is actually um, a lot of knowledge for us to realize that in Negros Occidental, our nurses are having coverage uh, compassion fatigue. However, to address that, um, they were able to make use of different coping activities in order that they will be uh, relieved from the compassion fatigue while they are on duty. And as you have mentioned, it's important to do peer preceptorship of senior nurses. But of course, this afternoon, we have also uh, invited a reactor for uh, Sir Glenn's uh, presentation. Um, he is actually um, the former hospital administrator and human resource manager at Lopez District Farmers Hospital Incorporated in Sagay City. He is currently a clinical instructor in Colegio San Agustin Bacolod and also our current PhD in nursing student. So without further ado, please welcome our second reactor, uh, Mr. Vincent Solidon. Thank you, Dr. Sheila, for the introduction and good afternoon to everyone. Anyways, uh, congratulations to Sir Dolendo for the study conducted as this is uh, one aspect in nursing which is not given much attention. Um, here are my insights. For me, compassion is, I believe, you need to suffer together. And according to Matthias and Wenzel, 2017, compassion fatigue is defined as a sustained feeling of tiredness with a diminished capacity to function effectively, both mentally and physically. I was once a hospital administrator and human resource manager in one of the level one private hospital in uh, Negros Occidental for three years. I have seen how my nurses went through the ordeal of compassion fatigue. I have empathized with them. I understood what they felt. And it prompted me to introduce steps and or strategies to minimize 
um, if not eradicate it. Maybe private owned hospitals have different experience than government owned hospitals. Just my two cents, uh, Sir Glenn. And when I saw your uh, PowerPoint slides, uh, the results of average, um, uh, average regarding compassion fatigue in all aspects is very interesting. Maybe uh, the age group which mostly comprise the res uh, respondents are, are active and are physically healthy and mostly are single. So, which means they don't have to think about children, about family matters, uh, financial matters, etc. And age is an important uh, variable in the study. Well, uh, according to the human uh, caring theory that was developed by uh, Gene Watson, as what you, sir, uh, presented earlier, um, the only relationship that exists between a patient and a nurse is that of caring, which requires compassion. Um, empathy, um, spiritual, emotional, and uh, physical presence in all of our nursing interactions with our patients. Therefore, um, she theorized that compassion is an integral part or aspect of a caring environment. And uh, furthermore, nurses must be healthy <laughs> in order to provide uh, patient care. Um, it, it should, however, be noted that nurses are often exposed to traumatic events of the people they care for, and uh, this can negatively impact patient care standards, um, how to relate with friends, uh, how to relate with your family, uh, colleagues, or even lead to more serious mental health disorders, especially depression post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety, a situation that is best described as, um, you know, what, what your topic about, sir, compassion fatigue. So uh, uh, it, it means a lot in your study that when I saw the results, I mentioned earlier, it was interesting because uh, I was expecting that it, it will be high, the, the, the compassion fatigue because of uh, what, what we as nurses experience when we care for the patient. But since your results are average, that's what uh, maybe there are factors involved. So uh, I'm very happy that you conducted this study so that we, we can understand uh, how we nurses feel. Because nowadays in this time of pandemic, we are like, you know, um, given a, a daunting task. Uh, I don't know if uh, most of the people outside of healthcare realize this. So it's good that this study was conducted and um, kudos to you, Sir Glenn. And I hope uh, you will conduct more studies, not just only for uh, government-owned hospital. Maybe you can also uh, add for a private-owned hospital. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sir Vincent. And of course, um, we are going to have our last presenter. Uh, please uh, reserve all your questions because we will be addressing that um, right after all our presenters have given their um, presentation. And then uh, we will also be posting the uh, evaluation link so you can immediately get your certificate following its uh, uh, following its uh, evaluation submission. So our next presenter is actually our icon in University of Saint Lazar College of Nursing, and <laughs> almost all of our graduate students, okay, students both in the undergraduate and the graduate programs, is her student and advisee. Um, we would like to highlight, though, this afternoon, that her passion for research is worth emulating. Wow. She is always a part of us and for sure will continue to be with us even beyond retirement. So without further ado, I would like to give you uh, our mentor and our uh, 
great example, an amazing um, nurse educator, uh, Dr. Loricita Ann Chua. Yeah. A round of, of virtual applause. Good afternoon to uh, everyone in this uh, colloquium. Uh, it is with uh, deep gratitude that I uh, thank you for this opportunity to be with you in the afternoon. Thank you to the organizers, especially to the Center of Research and Engagement uh, involvement with Dr. Tony Lachica and Dr. Shaila Trejera. Let me proceed now with a title that says Health Promotion, Behaviors and Lifestyle of the Members of an Academic Community. This is a university funded research uh, by the Center of Research and Engagement by the university. Uh, I'd like to introduce my topic with some topic generalizations and a brief overview of a few of my related literature and the gap why I, it allowed me to pursue this study. First, I'd like you to know that healthy behaviors and lifestyle impact an individual's quality of life holistically, and this has been done with a review that have been supported in these areas. With unhealthy behaviors and lifestyles by individuals, families, and communities can result into the development of non-communicable diseases. And that is highlighted with a study from the DOH. But it is also important to know that reducing the factors associated with this disease is by health promotion, education, and awareness. Uh, that has been highlighted by Russell, where he says that health promotion is one of the means of achieving wellness and the first step to disease prevention. So I'd like to introduce why the academic community, because the places where we live, learn, work, and play contribute to health. And that's why our workplace is an ideal environment to promote the health and well-being, especially of an adult community. Uh, the major focus of this study is really to determine the health promotion, behaviors, and lifestyle. I usually call this HPBL, but it's limited to the academic community in as much as my review of related literature and studies. These a lot of studies have been done on student population, on the elderly, on the religious community, into the community settings also, but uh, I have not so far seen a study that focuses on an academic community, particularly a university for that matter. So the, it seeks to answer the following questions. What is a profile based on the five um, variables? What is the awareness status of the members? And these are grouped into A, B, C, D, E. And what is the level, which is very important, based on the six subscales that have been reflected here. And the fourth, it seeks to find a significant difference between the two variables like profile over here, number one, and level of health promotion, behavior, and lifestyle, which is number three. Uh, this is purely a descriptive relational research with quantitative data technical analysis. Now, the participants were chosen purposively because they are members of the academic community with a permanent status and they perform specific institutional functions. And these are full time faculty, non teaching office personnel, administrators in three levels the basic education, the senior high school, and the college community, which also includes the buildings and grounds personnel, security, and engineering group, with close coordination for the HRD who gave me the list of these participants. The research instrument I'd like to highlight is an adult version, which is adopted from Susan Walker, which is called the HPLP, and an email consent was given to me to use it. He is recently now in North Dakota, USA. 
and for ethical considerations, a very detailed FBIC or informed consent was done, and it has undergone ethical clearance and approval from the research uh, ethics review committee. Uh, with statistical treatment, I'll discuss this together with the results, but basically I just group them into the, you know, the statement of the problems. Uh, they're just frequency and percentage, but the level was in terms of mean as a central tendency, but I also, my statistician also suggested Becker and Bermack to have a range of percentile from 25th to the 75th, which is called the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. <laughs> Please don't ask me how it's done. <laughs> it's by the statistician. And the difference, first of all, by sex was only uh, by man Whitney test because sex is only two, male and female, and all the rest of the other variables by Kruskal Wallis. Let me show you the results. The profile of academic community uh, is predominantly adult community, uh, mostly from 31 to 40 years of age, very productive, no adult, adult life, uh, but uh, predominantly female and are married with college degrees and a good number with post partum, uh, postgraduate degrees. Now, in terms of institutional function, the participants come mostly from the non-teaching office personnel, which we popularly call NTAP, because they are the largest number, I would say, in terms of our academic community. We have representation from the college faculty, from the basic education, the senior high. Administrators were also there to participate together with the engineering and security and buildings and grounds. A very few, yes, that's true because some of the engineering, security and buildings and grounds are no longer permanent status. Some of them, or I would say most of them are on contractual basis or by you know, subcontract. Uh, number two, in terms of awareness status, in terms of health related data, I divided it into four aspects. First, health related data in terms of height, weight, blood pressure, blood type. Yes, a good number of the academic members know their own height, weight, <laughs> and even their blood pressure and blood type too. Health related data is about awareness of their basic laboratory tests like CBC, blood sugar, no, and blood cholesterol and triglyceride being an adult community. This is very basic to get to know and a good number really gets to say they're within normal range or within normal limits. Health related data C looks into the history of family, you know, the very family conditions or diseases. The top two are hypertension and diabetes. And a good number are taking intake of maintenance medications for their specific health problems and conditions. And uh, by number, by person, uh, this is my person, not my percentage. And they, most of us, I would say a great number take supplements, vitamins, minerals with specific brand names in the market. The health related D, uh, data that reflects the physical activity uh, level. And if you notice the faculty, administrators, non-teaching personnel, personnel in relation to their work institutional function is lightly active. The engineering and security is considered to be active, but the buildings and ground personnel, a good number of them really said their activity level is very active. So it really reflects their institutional function and their presence in the academic community. Number three result shows a graph that tells us of the level of their health uh, promotion lifestyle. Uh, this actually tells us that with uh, mean scores per subscale, there are six of them, physical activity falls under low level. <laughs> so hold off your laugh first, low level academic community in terms of our health promotion. 
but health responsibility, nutrition, and stress management falls under the medium level of promotion and lifestyle, but interpersonal relationship and spiritual growth goes under the high level. On a personal note, I'd like you to know that this data was taken pre-COVID. The data was taken October 2019 to about February, uh, the initial week of February 2020, so pre-COVID. And it reveals that interpersonal relationship and spiritual growth has a high level of you know, influence over our health behaviors and lifestyle. I would say our administrators should be happy with this, instilling in each one of us the Lasallian spirituality, <laughs> okay, and what it means to live and commune with each other because interpersonal relationship is also rank high, but physical activity in the academic community seems to be at low level. And I will have measures to address this in my recommendations. Uh, this is a table that shows the significant difference between the two variables, which is profile, the five, like age, sex, civil status, educational attainment, institutional function, and the HPBL subscales. Now, the total actually reflects this in terms of this sex is by uh, Man Whitney. And the other variables are by Kruskal Wallis in terms of statistical no, intervention. And it's pretty obvious that the educational attainment has a significant influence over the level of your health promotion, behavior, and lifestyle. And I think most of you would give me a nod because later I'll tell you what it means to have health literacy. So we, we have to have a certain level of health literacy, adequate knowledge in order to implement certain behaviors and a lifestyle. And the second very significant would be the institutional function, which actually tells us that in as much as uh, we uh, assume uh, functions as faculty or non-teaching office personnel, uh, we, my majority of us are college graduates. So this proved to be significant. Thus, the hypothesis, I'd like to use the old statement rejected, but you so the hypothesis was not accepted. And my conclusion, I'd just like to highlight four basic things. First, the study portrayed the health promotion, behavior, lifestyle of the members, which somehow determines the practices, attitudes, and belief. Very important. Practices, attitudes, belief of individuals. But number two, I'd also like us to you know, look into that taking care of the mind is as important as taking care of the body because there's an overlap between the psyche and emotions with, uh, you know, impact on relationship, career, and even the physical body. And the third I'd like to highlight, although it is not entirely clear, so even with my related literature, it's not entirely clear how spirituality is tied up to physical health, but researchers indicate that spiritual vitality positively in fact impacts what we call health outcomes. And I think some of you would, you know, nod to this and say, the fourth I'd like to highlight is that health promotion goes as the core. And I'd like to emphasize the core, meaning it's really the inner aspect of lifestyle, you know, which addresses the culture and the environment. So being in an academic community, we have a particular culture and we have a particular environment. So a high level of health literacy, and this is what I mean when I talk about educational attainment is significant, leads to what you call positive health seeking behaviors. And thus, it actually is good for disease prevention. Now, among the recommendations that I have put there, I'd like to highlight the academic community because with limited time, and I have 10 slides, is to actively participate in the efforts. No, this is KSA knowledge, awareness, as well as commitment 
affect one's health and how is this possible? I have outlined what it means to have creative, you no know, creative uh, presentations, digital platforms. This has to be done on a regular schedule. And I have to tell you that with this COVID pandemic, I think most of these have already been implemented because we have very creative platforms, infographics no, that are blasted through our email and into our Facebook. Second is the concept of co-responsibility, talking about HR, human resource department issues wherein employees have to take guard of their own health care because this has budgetary allocations and can affect policies for availment of certain, you know, privileges and benefits. Third is I'd like to highlight a motivational system or incentive scheme yeah, yeah. because the more healthy, those who commit to a healthy behavior and lifestyle, those who commit, because we're talking of commitment, to healthy behavior and lifestyle, you know, would have like some kind of an incentive, whatever that would be. For now, we only have five days no, in terms of refund in our, you know, non-availment of uh, sick leave. But there could be other motivational and incentive schemes that can be employed. And tangible, I'd like to highlight tangible. In makita ba, you know, you see it with your senses, you hear it, you touch it. We saw that we, it, it doesn't involve only us, but we have to involve individual family and the entire academic community. And that's why I'm very happy to see a virtual run being done because families can be involved, children, father, mother, you know, it actually is a family affair. Uh, being the last, thank you for listening, but being the last presenter, I'd like to share my acknowledgement, which I, when I submitted this study that says that let this research project be my act of personal gratitude to the university that has been my home and family for 34 years as I retire soon. I am a witness, I mean, you know, active witness and participant to the quest and challenge of the university for excellence with the soul and competence and compassion for quality education. So I give you my deepest appreciation and thankfulness. I uh, offer this labor of love to all of you, my family, the administration, officers, and most of all to the College of Nursing faculty and staff. Thank you for listening. Madam Asalamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Chua. Indeed, okay, you thank are you. Retired. You are indeed retiring, but you are not tired. <laughs> Soon so I will be we tired. We are welcoming you back the soonest time possible when you retire. So I will be actually, tired soon. I also I would like to commit myself to actually exercise. I know everything that you have, I belong there. It's for the young adult in the profile. Okay. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, I would like to hear from our third day actor um, in this colloquium. Uh, she is a former clinical instructor of Colegio San Agustin and currently an external member of the Colegio San Agustin Ethics Board. She is uh, now currently employed as a CLMMRH pageant nurse supervisor and a CLMMRH research committee member on research management. She is on duty but never said no when invited for such a short notice. Fellow nurses, let us all welcome. Okay, my classmate and my uh, co-researcher for COVID-19 in Master Misaya's health research, which we are currently doing, um, Ms. Uh, Marites. Yes, Villagante. Let us all be Hello. Here. Let us all Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Marites. Thank you very much, Doc Shaila, for that introduction. So I'm very, very happy to be a part of the colloquium and to listen to the different researches conducted by my teachers in the University of St. Lasalle. So now I'm very happy and congratulations, first of all, to the College of Nursing. 
Dr. Anchu Wat, thank you very much for inspiring thank me you. for your study. So I was I was really happy to hear that and that you you made a study related to the lifestyle of the academe. Surely the result and the findings of your study is very, very significant because of, um, allow me to check my notes. No, it says here that um, those who are in the academe has a light activity as compared to those who on the ground and to those who are um, working now as guards. So they probably, if we, we are to use, um, um, what do you call this? Um, a certain uh, meter that would check the, the, the calories that they have used while walking. So surely uh, it would decrease their blood glucose level or even their blood pressure. So, so your recommendation actually is very, very uh, worth uh, to be um, informed for a policy or improvement in your uh, policy in the University of uh, St. LaSalle, just like, for example, you've mentioned, I'm very interested in, I, I like the one, I like the recommendation that you said that there should be an incentive scheme. So that is, a, this is a good encouragement to everyone that uh, they have to stay healthy, they have to, to eat um, food, healthy food, so that uh, they will be given extra money to spend because um, they are very healthy. The bad doc, doc for and, vacation. It's really uh, for yes, vacation, vacation, you know, yes. to unwind. Oh, okay. And, and it's and it's nice to 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 have a certificate that says that congratulations, you received, for example, twenty thousand pesos because you were not absent and because you are healthy. So that's a good um, yes. That's an inspiration also among our students who uh, based on statistics, most are obese. Most of our children now are obese. So when they see their teachers being healthy, so they, they get inspired uh, to be healthy as well. So with that, um, considering in our research agenda that non-communicable diseases is actually a concern, especially with diabetes um, and hypertension, so uh, they said that uh, to counteract uh, lifestyle diseases, like I've mentioned, like diabetes, is to start from the academe. So we start inspiring our students to be healthy. And of course, our teachers who are models to our students would, would be very, very happy and inspired to follow. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, um, you you use uh, actually Dr. Chua different types of models, and you said that health literacy is very very important because it would promote uh, lifestyle modification. On the other hand, there are a lot of health um, health uh, promotion models such as like tenders. They said that. Um, there are individual characteristics and experiences that affects their, their behavior. And this behavior at times would either be positive or negative. And whatever the outcomes of their positive or negative behavior would really show who they are as an, an individual. So probably um, this could, your study will be an eye opener to all teachers to all uh, the community of the academe to start to start working or start dancing while teaching probably to lower down their blood glucose level or to start probably singing while while teaching so that at least they can lower down their blood glucose level. I'm very, very happy with your study, Dr. Shua. I hope that uh, you will continue the, probably there will be part one, part two, part three, in which uh, this time, this is just, I'm sorry, Dr. Chua, this is just a recommendation. So probably you can use uh, your study using probably a different variables, just like, for example, 
use now of our students, what are now probably their health profile. So along the line, probably they are not aware that their weight it does not coincide for their height. So at least from there, this can be a good opportunity that your study will be of help also to our, our students. But thank you for that study because uh, that study would help us also people in the clinical area um, to be at peace because there are already educators that would help prevent um, lifestyle diabetes just like uh, um, um, I've uh, just like the study that I have conducted uh, way back 2017, in which we try to calculate the cost of diabetes mellitus and the effect of which to peritoneal dialysis. So it's very, very sad that the amount goes up to millions, especially for those who had already complications of renal disease. So I hope that the study will, will not just uh, will not just end in, in the presentation of this, but uh, probably Dr. Chua, uh, the infographics or the videos that will be available along the alleys of the University of St. LaSalle uh, discussing about uh, lifestyle diseases and modification, or even a simple picture of a student's like running or walking uh, could be an inspiration to everyone to prevent this type of uh, problem that we have in the community. Congratulations, Dr. Chua. Thank you, Ms. Villagante. Thank you, Ms. Maritas. Thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Ms. Tess. And thank you for also your, for the commitment that you shared with me while I was having my vaccine this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, to Dr. Doc doctor. <laughs> Sharing, sharing um, our safety for everyone in the community. Thank so, you. Um, I would like to ask everyone before we start with the question and answer. Thank you very much, classmate tests. Um, to please try to look at the chat box. I have already posted the link for your evaluation. As soon as you are you are able to um, uh, fill that up, you will receive your your uh, certificates for this particular uh, colloquium. So uh, without further ado, I will be asking you uh, to please try to um, unmute yourself should you have any question to our three uh, presenters. Uh, first, first and foremost, Dr. Uh, Jocelyn May Flor Cadena, uh, our former dean and also our former assistant vice chancellor for academic affairs. Also, uh, Mr. Glendo Lendo, our um, uh, uh, vice administrator or assistant administrator uh, in the province for innovation and also our um, iconic uh, mentor Dr. Lorisita Antonia Chua. So um, we will give you uh, we will give at least two questions uh, the most unless you don't have any uh, to all our uh, presenters this afternoon. Okay. They are ready. Anyone? This uh, Dr. Ann, that we have so many participants today. There were about 90 plus who registered. As of this time, we had uh, the most 78 participants who came in. Um, and uh, they come from all over the country. And even the others are abroad. So hopefully this uh, presentation, uh, our presentations of all our presenters uh, were of a uh, source of learning to everyone. So is there any other question? Uh, you can post it in the chat box or you can just uh, raise your hand so and be acknowledged. Okay, so I guess everyone is able to learn a lot. There were only a request if we can share the video uh, of this uh, Zoom presentation uh, so that uh, they can go back to, to uh, the results and findings of your study. Some are actually using it as their learning uh, um, uh, tool 
in doing their own study as well. So thank you for sharing. Look, she, uh, Sir Oliver yes. is raising his hands. Yeah, I'm sorry I cannot uh, see Sir Oliver. Uh, Sir Oliver, you are acknowledged. Please try to um, open your video so you can actually be given focus on your question. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Sir Tom, uh, kindly put on your microphone. <clears throat> Doc she Yes, no. five dimension. Yeah, I have to mention Sir Fitz, Sir Fitz Gerald from PMA mm. uh, Result Chapter. Hello, okay. Sir Fitz. Yeah. <laughs> We have been together uh, from the ICOS, the PNA, and a lot more. Um, Thanks, thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, sir. <laughs> afternoon, sir. Hi, sir. Peace. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir, for attending. Uh, I think diabetes is a society of nurses. Right? Yes. Yes, for, I don't have actually question, but I would like to comment uh, yeah. the other, all of the presentations were good for you, but I was um, actually maybe in line with the presentation of Dr. Chuba since my practice is in diabetes. And I think I was able to uh, conduct this study on health promoting of the faculty in relation to their, in relation to their performance. So the, the results of Dr. Chuba was very good. And I have seen uh, very much relation to of course, the performance and uh, practices of not only the faculty but also the students. So there's really an effect the promotion by staff. Thank, thank you, you Sir Fitz. Thank you, Sir Fitz. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there any other, uh, Sir Tom? Are you going to ask your question? Please try to unmute yourself and uh, put on your video to be acknowledged. Okay. So he raised his hand. I guess but, uh, uh, if there's oh, none, uh, please, <laughs> uh, last reminder, can you please try to fill up the Can you please try to fill up our evaluation form? But before that, let me um, share my screen so I can uh, probably be together with Dr. Ni An uh, uh, because uh, our other officers are actually in our parent uh, student uh, presentation uh, or assembly for the face to face um, uh, orientation. Let me share my screen uh, to recognize our um, presenters this afternoon. The same a uh, certificate will also be given to our reactors. So, let me um, share um, the certificate of uh, recognition is actually uh, presented to our um, <clears throat> Uh, presenters. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jocelyn Mayflar Cadena for sharing valuable insights and inspiration to the nursing students, faculty, parents, and the silent community during the second nursing research colloquium of our academic year 2020-2021 held on March 24, 2021 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon by Zoom. Given this uh, day, at the University of St. Lazaro College City, Negros Occidental, Philippines, uh, signed IBG Demni and Dr. Romeo Teruel. Uh, the same certificate is actually uh, given to um, Mr. Glenn E. Dolendo, RN, MAN, for her valuable, for his, share, for sharing rather his valuable insights and inspiration to the nursing students, faculty, parents and the silent community during the second nursing research colloquium for this academic year. And of course, the same uh, text okay, reads for our um, 
uh, Dr. Loricita Antonia A. Chua for sharing her inspiring uh, presentation this afternoon uh, with our nursing students, faculty, parents, and the silent committee during the second nursing research colloquium for academic year 2020-2021. So with that, let us give uh, our presenters a warm hand of applause. Okay. So uh, without further ado, I would like to say that our commitment to research as educators, nurses, and clinical practitioners never stop. The effort is amazingly challenging. Our esteemed faculty and partners in the affiliating agencies and different nurse practitioners are well appreciated all over the country for their participation this afternoon. We come together today to learn and share our research results of our faculty and esteemed mentors on the new knowledge to improve our quality of life, the real essence while we are doing research that is shared with our work, family, and community safety. With this, I would like to thank you all and congratulate everyone who participated. I hope you have received already uh, your certificates. And for those who have not yet um, filled up your certificates, please, or rather the evaluation form, please try to uh, fill it up so you can have your certificates. Leave Jesus in our hearts. Forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son, Father of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Thank Amen. You so thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shea. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations, everyone. Yeah. Can we, have, can we have our picture, please, for those who are here? Okay. Um, ready? Ready? One, two, three. Thank you so much. We will try to um, have it documented. Uh, you will be also uh, sent the link of the presentation uh, of the Zoom uh, recording. Hopefully, we can uh, facilitate that through our um, uh, Craig. Okay. okay. And uh, maybe it could be emailed as well. And then let's have another uh, group, second batch. Uh, can you please try to open your, for those who wanted to be acknowledged, open your video. Thank you so much. And then let's go to the last uh, slide. Okay. Okay, last but not least. Please try to open your um, slide. Paolo, I can see you. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Um, with this, um, please try to connect with us should you have any question or not able to receive your uh, uh, certificates. On behalf of the College of Nursing, our Dean, uh, Ivy G. Demi, our academic coordinator has been very kind this afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. Tony Ann, thank you so much. And the, the rest of the faculty would be very supportive, Dr. Jo, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chua, and the other uh, partners from other affiliating schools as far as Davao and Manila and Rizal. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Man Dr. So, Thank you for organizing this. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Congratulations. Okay, Thank you. The other people will be doing their <laughs> shared exhibits. Thank you so much. 